greetings all and welcome to this live stream with me, Elizabeth Hobson, also known as Anti Fembot, and the lovely Greta Aurora. Today we're going to be talking about why feminism can't do something useful and the subject of female agency. And I believe, Greta, that you've had your female agency brought into question recently. Yeah, this is a very long story, but I just try to summarize it very briefly for those who are not familiar with the recent allegations against Marilyn Manson. So I am being used in a lawsuit by Marilyn Manson's former personal assistant as an example of him degrading his female fans. And, and I'm also being portrayed and, and I described as though I'd been a minor at the time and I was 19. So the reason this story is very useful for them in attacking him and trying to portray him as this monster and predator is because I was a virgin at the time, at the age of 19. So when most people hear the phrase, a young girl followed by her being a virgin, mm -hmm. they're not going to think of a 19 year old woman. I mean, what would you say is the range of a young girl if you just hear that phrase out of the range out of, of young girl i mean not girl be, but young girl yeah it would be under 16 without a doubt and that's exactly that's the kind of obscure language lawyers yeah. often use they're not being specific just so they can always say they, yeah. they didn't we didn't say that but they are implying no. it they yeah. are clearly trying to imply that I was underage at the time. And those of you who have seen my videos on Marilyn Manson will know that I was contacted on two occasions by Evan Rachel Wood's girlfriend. Evan Rachel Wood is one of the main accusers, Marilyn Manson's formal girlfriend. And they sent me these emails to try to gauge what my experience with him was like. But at the time, the first email I received October last year, the second one, January this year. It came from an official email address, the Phoenix Act email address, which is uh, legislation they introduced in California to reduce the statute of limitations. But it's also something that they disguised as this support group for these mm. wounded women mm. who just somehow miraculously randomly found each other who were all abused by Marilyn Manson. And, mm. and they're presenting it as this massive coincidence that all these women found each other mm. and how, and how mm. great it is that they get to support each other. And they were basically trying to recruit me to join that group and plan this coordinated attack. And what was your response? Did you well, I didn't, the thing is, I didn't even really know who Evan Rachel Wood was. I, no. kind of, I kind of knew she dated Marilyn Manson, but I just, when I saw her name in that email, because this person who emailed me was referring to her, she was saying that, I, she was close to Evan Rachel Wood and there was supposed to ring an alarm in my head or something, but I thought it was spam. Yeah. I, I just get yeah. so much crazy yeah. stuff yeah. by email. Like I would have never thought much of it. But when I saw the first allegations come out in February, I kind of connected the dots immediately. And then I came out with a video to describe my experience with him, which was very brief. It was just a weekend and to also talk about those emails. And despite all of that, they have decided me to include me in this lawsuit. Yeah. Not, I'm not mentioned by name, mm. but they clearly identify me. They say it, what they say, which year and which month it was, and it was in Vienna, Austria, January, 2011. So it is, it is clear. And obviously it makes me furious because I didn't, oh, yeah. I, I didn't agree to work with them on that and no. still, they would have loved to have my name, obviously, and my approval to be included in, in the lawsuit. But even though I didn't give them any of that, they still somehow had the nerve yeah. to, to use me. And there, there's this point in the lawsuit where they talk about how he regularly degraded his female fans. And I am the only example there. There is no oh. other example. And the degradation supposedly is that he texted Ashley, his former personal assistant, after we had sex mm -hmm. and bragged about it. <laughs> wow. 
incredible it does raise questions about like consent you know consent is supposed to be so important to them and yet they sought your consent and it was not forthcoming and they've decided to use you as mm. a tool in their arsenal anyway yeah so it's one thing that we're supposed to just accept any women's subjective account of their experience and they use these big words abuse rape to mean whatever they want it to mean. Mm -hmm. And we're just supposed to go along with their personal definition. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But this is a whole other level when they are a third person is describing my personal experience mm -hmm. and interprets it according to their own definition mm -hmm. and passes judgment on how I was feeling. Mm -hmm. And then uses that as evidence in a lot of Yeah, suit. but I mean, you know, this brings me are in into mind of the hate crime legislation that we were talking about earlier and so you know misogyny as a hate crime is law in scotland and is being <coughs> trialed in various places in the uk and pushed for as a national law and um i'm assuming that in line with current hate crime legislation the evidence required is the perception of the victim or any witnesses yeah. and so it is you know like someone could see one of us like bantering about with one of our friends and you know he says oh you're such a bitch or something and some feminist some radical feminist across the street hears it and she goes to the police and suddenly he's you know being prosecuted for committing a hate crime yeah, but they, surely they must ask you how you felt about it. Or Yeah, I'm sure they would ask, but would it count for anything? Mm. And, and that's obviously my main worry in this case. Mm. Like, and I mean, some of the accusations against him are utterly laughable. You know, I have not read everything forensically, but what I have read, nothing has stuck out to me as being blatant um evidence or even you know if it's true suggesting that he is an abuser or a misogynist mm -hmm. and the clip you showed me earlier with esme bianco yeah. or bianco is bianco it? bianco that was quite incredible do you want to tell the audience about that yeah so this is a woman who used to work in london as a bdsm performer and fetish model she was she, it's well documented that she was involved in the BDSM and fetish scene. And that's obviously why Marilyn Manson asked her to star in one of his music videos. And Good Morning America interviewed this woman and they completely omit any context about her experience with BDSM whatsoever. The way they present her story is that she was this innocent angelic being who was born yesterday <laughs> yeah who yeah. ended up in this chaotic scene where she was just mm -hmm. tied up out of nowhere and then and then whipped and she she didn't know what was happening she feared mm -hmm. for her life mm -hmm. and then a sentence later they say that she, they ended up starting a sexual relationship months after that so that, that's like yeah. a completely different story yeah. but just but the way the media portrays these these allegations it is infuriating and the way this woman talks about her experience that she was transported to the United States and now she's suing Manson for human trafficking too because apparently buying a woman a plane ticket to a foreign country is now human trafficking but yeah the craziest thing about all these allegations is how these women willfully deprive themselves of agency and speak of themselves as though they'd been little children at the time Mm. They, they speak of being groomed when they were over the age of 18. In some cases, in their late 20s, they were, be, they were groomed. I mean, just how ridiculous is that? And they mm. were being manipulated. Like Esme Bianco in her late 20s, she, she didn't re recognize some, something bad was happening to her. You know, After she'd already had extensive experience of the DSM. Yeah, I mean if she wanted to be candid about the whole thing for some reason she decided not to approach it that way but she could have spoken honestly about her previous experience and said that 
in BDSM, there are safe words, which is a very important mm, mm. aspect. And she could potentially have argued that in this case, there yeah. were no safe words. Yeah. That's why I didn't count it. But, but she doesn't do that. She doesn't she don't choose to go down the truth. Mm -hmm. She's decided to portray herself as having no background information about the whole thing whatsoever. Although she does say that they had some preparatory conversations. And, she, and he did actually, she quotes him as saying that he would have to manhandle her. Mm -hmm. And he warned her that it was going to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But we don't know about the extent of the conversation. Like what was exactly that with regards to the music videos? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So we don't know about the exact nature of that. No, but he went to a professional in that sphere. It's pretty for obvious. For a reason, yeah, yeah. you know. And now, over 10 years later, she is approaching it as though she had no role in the whole thing whatsoever. And this is this is what we see in all these allegations. A lot of mm. Me Too type allegations, but it is just so striking in all the allegations against Marilyn Manson. Like, there's this other woman who was 26 at the time, and she says she was just a kid. That, that's literally what she said. So these women either consciously or unconsciously must realize mm. the power this self-infantilization gives them in an absurd way because people are yeah. going to pay more attention to this obviously yeah. if a young woman a naive innocent young girl is abused by this dangerous monster there's going to be a big story so it's you know it's mm. no wonder the media is inflating it mm. so so they are aware of the very power this gives them, and this is such an interesting dichotomy, the way women are the only beings whose weakness can be a source of power, and the way the yeah. meeting movement explores this power yeah. is, is, is really surreal. It really is, and I think, you know, I mean, I remember looking into the allegations against Harvey Weinstein, mm -hmm. and it's like the an awful lot of them just looked very much like these women made a conscious decision to have some kind of sexual relationship with him in order to um, further their careers. And it's like to then, you know, some of them did indeed manage to further their careers. Some of them didn't, you know, and perhaps they're bitter that they did that, they degraded themselves and they then didn't um, benefit from that, you know. But it's like, I sort of feel like, well, aren't the real victims in this whole culture the women who are modest and um, refuse to use their sexual kind of um, resource to further themselves on, on or at they, least be honest and, about and it. then and then you know therefore miss out on opportunities to you know go to Hollywood and be in Marilyn Manson videos and go on to Game of Thrones <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um and but nobody sort of thinks of them yeah I mean I really you know, don't like the word of, victim mm, but I know, well, I, know yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you're saying yeah it just, I mean, it takes credibility away from all women in general. Yeah. And also there's going to be this underlying assumption that there must be some arterial motive all the time. It's either the woman is trying to obtain something in exchange of sex or simply trying to set the man up. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, to I know. money in the future. I know, I know. But, you know, I think like with sort of, your video about the hero archetype in mind I think there are a lot of hero women who either refuse to engage in um that sort of thing at all and use withholding sex as a tool or will behave in a way where they use the sex as a tool and then stab whatever man they slept with in the back afterwards I think that there are far too many women who are willing to do that. And there are far too few Aphrodite women who enjoy it for the sake of pleasure. 
and you know approach the sexual arena with their male partners as their equals mm -hmm. and co kind of explorers in an intimate journey it's a very good point i mean the amount of people who have tried to convince me that i really was a victim mm. because i was so young and i was yeah. used people are trying to convince me that i was in fact used just because it was a very short liaison and no one i mean these people don't even they don't grant me agency in the situation you know they don't allow me to enjoy myself mm -hmm. because they have this preconceived idea that again anything women do they must have some other everything is a means to an end they always mm. must have an arterial motive but i made it very clear in several videos i've done that it was entirely consensual mm. and and anyway a relationship is not always it, it is a very hurtful stereotype that a lot of women a lot of people have about women that we are always striving for a relationship any interaction we have with a man yeah it's always <clears throat> to lure him in yeah and then capture him yeah and i'm sorry that might be true for a lot of women but it is not true for all of us and we we should be allowed to make decisions for ourselves as long as we are prepared to deal with the responsibilities yeah and in a lot of these allegations the women did decide to make use of their sexual freedom achieved through mm. sexual liberation mm -hmm. they will go out there and and enjoy that freedom but then they refuse to take responsibility, responsibility. it yeah. is still the man who should somehow be watching out for them yeah and and asking every step of the way whether yeah. whether it's still okay as maybe Anko makes it clear and a lot of these women make it clear that they never tried to object they actually yeah, proudly yeah. proclaim i never said no i wouldn't have dared to say say no but why exactly and you know if there was a place for feminism i think it would be sort of the Camille Pallia brand of Amazon feminism that teaches women to say what they mean and mean what they say and you know it's kind of ironic that that feminism is doing the exact opposite and it's taking women's power and agency away from them and how can that be a movement for women's liberation it makes no sense so it is as though they want to be liberated from responsibility, re responsibility. <laughs> they want mm. the rights obviously mm. that come with freedom but no yeah. corresponding obligations no and i guess there must be a way to make it known to women to somehow communicate it to them that you can't have one without the other it yeah. is it is actually degrading to yourself it is actually very backwards and regressive mm. Mm. to willfully take that agency away from yourself and to say that because you're a woman mm. because women like evan rachel wood for example says that women sometimes freeze in dangerous situations well so yeah that's that's i mean everybody does accountable. that is that is part of the spectrum you know fight flight freeze that happens yeah, but it's just but, play, playing into this very old stereotype yeah, that you know that are unable to think the for useful thing to do is to say you know people freeze and people need to um work on that you know and when people freeze in a situation and it leads them to being violated in some way they need to harness the lesson from that and next time and fight uh, or flight you know rather than pretending that there's nothing they could have possibly done yeah because they are women and you know it, it's really cruel on an individual level to tell women who do feel that they've been violated that there was nothing they could have done because if there was nothing that they could have done then there's nothing that they can do in the future that's going to protect them and it's just going to happen randomly again and again and yeah. they will never feel safe mm. so it, it basically creates creates a very but they they will always perceive their environment as very dangerous as long mm. as there are men out there after six o'clock 
Yeah. And then where it gets us is this cause for a curfew for men and women taking to Twitter to share the stories of yeah. how afraid they feel walking home at night. Like I I might have felt a bit unsafe. I, yeah, of I've course. lived in London for 10 years. Yeah. I might have had moments where I kind of I heard a weird noise mm. when I heard someone mm. shudder, I heard a drunk person oh, shudder. I mean, I, I regularly walk home with my keys between my knuckles. You see, I've never really done are... that either. It seems to be a big thing, but I've, ne I've never, well, it never yeah, occurred no, to me to I, do that. I do do that, you know, although I think I'd, but be, men too, do I'd be too timid to use it. But yeah, I, I've, I'm yet to meet a man who, when I look him in the eye and say, come on, be honest with me, have you ever felt unsafe when you're out in public? Of course they do, and they have all taken precautions. And men are more likely to be down that too. street, or you know, crossing the street to get away from that gang, whatever, mm. to keep themselves safe. That is part and parcel of living in a big city. And it's a very rational fear on men's part because statistically, men are a lot more likely to be attacked. Yeah, well, I mean, I to it's, be it's rational to be a little bit uh, on guard and fearful yeah. when you are out and about because there are not cases you know mm. in the world and but it, you know what's not rational is to feel a heightened sense of fear at all times and it's not rational to go well i feel scared so we should lock men up in the evenings mm. there's there's no <laughs> rational train of thought that leads to that Anyway, we have got comments scrolling. So should we go back to the beginning and see what we've got? We also have some questions that some yeah. other people have sent us. But you, you have a look Let's at have a look comments. through here and then we'll have a look through the questions that have been sent earlier. So good evening to Turkey and Yassam, who's over there. Oh, no. Poor Vin G has got to go to work. I hope you had it. He's going to catch this later. So I hope you've had a good day at work. Very productive and all that. Good evening to Zimbabwe. Wow, we've got a global audience. How exciting. JWG somewhere far away. <laughs> and leverage, leveraging sexuality goes back to time immemorial. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah, but it's one thing to leverage sexuality and then another thing to afterwards pretend they didn't know what you were doing basically so yeah. we have obviously spoken about the femme fatale architect many mm -hmm. times and i'm obsessed mm -hmm. with it but the femme fatale knows exactly what she is doing and she and would never present herself well, there's, well, there's the thing, well, if you look at film noir, if you look yeah. at some film noirs, she might sometimes do that, but that's but that's not the point, because that what you see in films is basically an interpretation of the archetype itself. But if you if you go back to the, to the Bible or to stories, mythologies from the ancient world, the femme fatale is always a powerful woman who's part of that power is knowing what she wants and then knowing how to get that. But then part of knowing what you want is also knowing how to say no, for example, mm. and, and, to, and to communicate yeah. what, what you want. Yeah. So it is no wonder feminism has a huge issue with the femme fatale. And we have spoken yeah. in, in our last stream and previous conversations, we've spoken about what happened at the Manchester Art Gallery where they removed mm -hmm. the beautiful waterhouse painting mm -hmm. because it was supposed to portray women as mindless decorative features in a painting, luring men into their demise. <laughs> but again, it's a typical feminist interpretation because those nymphs in the painting actually have agency. They know exactly what they want and, and they're fulfilling their purpose. And, and they are not victims. Yeah, but I mean, perhaps that's why feminists don't like it because it is acknowledging yeah. that feminine power that they are trying so very hard to um, camouflage. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you know, you mentioned the Bible and obviously there's the story of Potiphar's wife 
who um, wants to sleep with Joseph and Joseph is not into that. And so she ac falsely accuses him of assault yeah. and he gets thrown in prison and all of that. And, um, you know, so that's obviously a very old story. And so whether leveraging sexuality goes back to time immemorial, you know, it's certainly very old. But I have been reading or I've started to read um, Nathanson and Young's book, Replacing Misandry, which is like there was three of them. So um, spreading misandry is very famous and that's kind of um, a catalog in a way of all the many ways in which misandry is crops up in modern culture mm. and then there's another called sanctifying misandry which I've never dipped into so I have no idea what that's about and then replacing misandry begins with some evo psych and they talk about how um, you know in well feminists have this myth of the sort of matriarchal or egalitarian utopian sort of uh, you know um prehistory kind of period yeah. that was then subverted by malevolent patriarchal forces um but you know they suggest that it was there was, you know, a division of labor even then. And that while we had the same kind of division of labor, there was there was also a respect for the different roles that men and women have. Um, and so, you know, they point out that men were expected to risk their lives in hunting and women were expected to risk their lives in childbirth. And so <clears throat> I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I tend to, I tend to kind of agree that leveraging sexuality, hmm, I, I tend to suspect that that wasn't a feature of prehistoric man. Mm. I tend to suspect that, and you know, I, d I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of um, modern kind of um, communities that are like hunter gatherer kind of communities are quite sexually free and mm. they have kind of multiple partners and there isn't a kind of mate yeah. garden and stuff like that. Yeah. And so in a situation where, you know, all of the men and women in a community can have sex with all of the men and women in a community at their will it would be difficult for a woman to leverage her sexuality because if she's like well i'm going to you know tempt you with sex and possibly withhold it and possibly give it and you know if i do give it then it's going to be with the threat of potentially you know telling everybody that you violated me and stuff like that i don't see how that mm. would work within that community yeah and, you know, assuming that they are something like our prehistory, you know, I don't think that leveraging sex is necessarily immemorial, but I do think it's very old. And, you know, I think it probably, when do you think it would have started? Well, according to Christopher Ryan in the, Sex and Dawn, the book, he refers to a lot of research. He mm. argues that it started with agricultural societies. I, I mean, I have not thought this through at all, but I was kind of thinking about the agricultural mm. revolution. And, and that's actually very important because there was not really a concept of personal property until that time. So they shared right. the idea is, or the and the theory is that they would share food mm -hmm. within the tribe, they mm -hmm. would share resources, and they would share partners too. Mm -hmm. there, there, weren't, there was no such thing as a nuclear family as there isn't in contemporary hunter-gatherer mm -hmm. societies. However, once they started cultivating land, then the concept of owning land became 
very important for you to survive. You needed to have a piece of your own land. And, and therefore, and um, men were owning the, those yeah, lands. Yeah, so, and therefore, so women um, became men more dependent wanted on to pass on their land to their offspring, mm -hmm. and therefore, they wanted to have an exclusive relationship. Well, that, that too. And it also meant that foreign tribes or families would invade trying to get your land so that they yeah. can have more. Yeah. So that women. So we have to see it in context that women from that point onwards were kind of considered property alongside other resources. But when you own something, you're going to protect the thing. Mm. You know. Yeah, but I mean, also, you know, I mean, the sort of property analogy is a bit shaky because, you know, um, property something that is yours is yours to do with as you will and I don't know of any times that I've heard of wherein women were property to the degree to the degree that if her husband you know mistreated her mm -hmm. that a blind eye was turned to it because she was just a piece of property yeah you know there was still a value an intrinsic human value yeah men, men had. had a duty to protect their women their wives and their daughters whereas men were required to protect themselves yeah and women had to be protected from other tribes invading yeah. from foreign lands or even neighbors turning against each other so there were lots of reasons why women were placed in that position where mm -hmm. they were prized they were actually prized very highly and were considered yeah. very valuable and you know of course that kind of um evolution or revolution whichever way you want to put it um would have begun the disadvantaging of most men because women would want to be with a specific man who could provide for her and you know that would mean that only the most successful were kind of um eligible yeah and then hierarchies formed like hunter-gatherer societies are fairly egalitarian they are mm. kind of almost utopian in that sense everyone shares a piece of what they've got because because what, tomorrow the future, John they might have, have it you know yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a precaution it kind of makes sense it doesn't mean mm. those societies are, are all perfect and and they only operate from a, a, pla a place of modesty and and you know they they are self-interested as mm -hmm. as all mm. beings are mm. But the self-interest serves a purpose. And then once you get to agricultural societies, you don't then then you have you start to have a concept of what is yours and and you're going to protect that with tooth and nail. The same way hunter gatherers had no property, no such property to protect, basically. What's that imperfect citizen saying? Even without property rights, territory is a biological imperative similar to many mammals. And as such, women and eligible pair bonding women, men, have taken priority in the sexual marketplace, women. Okay. Well, there was no such thing as a sexual marketplace in that sense because they didn't even, they weren't even really sure about reproduction. Like the, no, exactly. Uh, there, there are tribes. I think this is from Australia that still to this day believe that babies are created by an accumulation of sperm. Right. So the more men a woman has sex with, the better because the more yeah. men will contribute their yeah. good qualities. Yeah. So in that society, it's it is highly desirable for a woman to have sex with as many men as possible. So there is no such concept of well, in order to have a marketplace, you kind of have to bid. I guess it's still up to the woman, in theory, to decide which man he wants to have sex with. But then their concept of, like, 
status, for example, are probably very different to ours. Mm. And and also the women. So in the space that I read, they were saying that the women seek out very different types of men just to make sure that their offspring will have the best of all yeah, those. Yeah. So they so they Lots they want attributes. They won't search mm. for men along a single hierarchy, but they yeah. will search for the best warriors, hunter the, best and, hunter, you know, the best farmer, and, and the best and maybe craftsman. Even, and maybe, yeah, the like artist. some artist, yeah. some <laughs> sensitive person, yeah. like all those traits that you want to mm. see in your child. So that's nothing like the idea of the alpha male we have mm. these days, who has an unlimited supply of women who want to be near him, you know, we, ha we have no reason to believe that was always the case. Because again, we have societies that just don't operate according to those values. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Speaking of revolutions, like, I wonder sometimes whether, you know, the whole Me Too movement is a reaction, an overreaction to the sexual revolution. Because obviously, you know, that was pushed for in part by a lot of feminists who wanted women to be liberated, you know, and they were kicking down an open door because it was like, well, you know, patriarchal white cis hetero science men had already been working on the pill, you know what I mean? And it was that in the invention, that invention that liberated women um, to have sex with whoever they wanted. But, you know, it's certainly something that, feminists were keen on back in the day so kind of second wave feminists i, I just let, let's come back to this i just want to mm. i think there's some confusion about the specific trap that i was talking about so the idea was that now we know obviously that only a single sperm can fertilize a single egg what these tribes believe in their folklore they they don't know they don't know about eggs and sperm what they believe is that different sperm come together inside the woman's body to form a baby, unite with the essence of the woman and then contribute the essence of all those men combining together. So so obviously women cannot have sex without men, cannot have children without men. So this is just an example of how potentially our distant ancestors viewed reproduction because it was such a mystery you know it wasn't yeah. at all obvious yeah the exact no i mean you this. know the kind of pagan idea was that we were impregnated by ghosts you know and spirits mm. um and there's that fabulous moment in the wicker man where you know edward woodward goes to visit christopher lee in his manor house and christopher lee says to edward woodward I trust the sight of the children jumping over the bonfire, um, what inspires you or something like that. And Edward Woodward says it does not. And, you know, then Christopher Lee goes on to explain that they're jumping over the bonfire in the hopes that the god of the fire will fertilize them. And, you know, he makes the um, draws the comparison between um, them and their beliefs and the Virgin Mary, mm. you know. And then he says, and of course, you know, what woman would not prefer the child of God to that of some acne scarred artisan? <laughs> Such a lovely moment. Mm. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that there has the so feminists kind of fought for this sexual revolution and for women to be free to have casual sex. And then they, yeah, they kind of, you know, the, that dream was realized and they have discovered that it's not fulfilling for a lot of women and that um, it lowers women's, you know, women as a whole, their sexual market value so that the women who want to utilize their sexual power as a tool are less able to um and they're kind of kicking back against that and it's really regressive 
you know, I think that the sexual revolution was progress. I don't think it was unalloyed progress. And I think that being sexually free is not for every man or woman. Um, but, you know, I think that it's it, it people are better neighbors when they you know step back and say well what you're doing that is not harming anyone else is fine by me mm. i'll do me you do you uh but that doesn't occur very frequently in our society and that's why i've been studying the differences the psychological significance of like monotheism and polytheism and, and what monotheism means in our society is that there's only one right way. It doesn't matter if you believe in God. We are we live in this post-Christian era where we are still influenced by this idea, of this biblical teaching, the fundamental of which is that there can only be one right way. And if you don't choose my way, then how? It, you don't have to follow me down this road, but then the other road leads to hell, basically. Mm. So this is not mm. so the sexual revolution follows the same pattern. They just replace one monotheism with another, going from the sexually repressive prior status quo. Mm -hmm. They shave the paradigm to go to one where all women are not expected to have sex like men. And and mm -hmm. they're and they're being shamed if they if they want to pursue more conservative ideals yeah that's true you know especially young women like young women are expected to pursue a very masculine uh, pathway it's like you know so, i mean i remember when i got pregnant at 19 and people kind of looked at me aghast and with horror and you know i'd go to cafes and women would be like you're too young and it was really bizarre you know but we're we're supposed to go and get a career and you know worry about children later like men can and, and it's not a bad do. choice as real not as real choice, liberation no. would be yeah so there is the psychological significance that's why i'm so drawn to ancient traditions because like in ancient greece for example there was no concept of evil as we know it and within our Christian framework, there was order and chaos. There was their main polarity. Mm -hmm. there, there wasn't this idea that you're either good or bad, but there were stages, there was a spectrum of what's acceptable. And then yeah. there were these, they, they yeah. recognized all these many different forces which can rule a human soul. Mm -hmm. and, and they recognized that many of these different forces are valid. Valid, yeah, exactly. Obviously, they can get pathological. Yeah, it's it's not like anything goes. It's not complete chaos, is what we're seeing today in many ways with the eradication, attempted eradication of the sexes, for example. It's not that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is embracing a broader range of in which we can manifest our nature and express mm -hmm. the desires of our soul, which Christianity doesn't really allow for as loving as some say jesus is he still only gives you one right road to go down on otherwise it's burn forever in, in misery and and the greeks didn't have um hell or a devil you know it's just so interesting i was reading about the origin of this is like a segue but like very briefly i was reading about the origin of the, the devil, the monotheistic mm. idea. Obviously, if you only have a single God, mm. this is a very, very sharp category, just mm. one God, then you're going to have something on the other end, something, mm. a shadow of that, which is the devil. And the way Christians, well, also it goes back to Jewish tradition, but I am more familiar with Christian tradition. So the, the way they constructed the idea of the devil is that they took this, minor greek god lucifer mm -hmm. whose name translates to uh, greek and roman his name translates to light bringer and he was a descript he was one aspect of the planet venus mm -hmm. so this is when i learned about this uh, a few months ago i just i mean everything kind of makes sense in a way now that 
it is no coincidence that sexuality ha has been repressed in all monotheistic traditions. When you take mm. Venus, Aphrodite, the representation of sensual joy, bodily, but also heavenly pleasure, the celebration of the beauty of the soul and all the senses, you, you take that and then you force it on the ground. Mm -hmm in the realm of Hades, which by himself wasn't evil either. He was just the ruler of the, the underworld. But now you have that, and now you have chaos, like Dionysus. Mm -hmm. Also, you, you take that away from your god figure and force it underground. So what you are left with in the image of this one god is perfect order, rationality, logic, basically existing in your head and rejecting mm -hmm. the, that which mm -hmm. the body has to offer as i mean it's okay as long as you're only doing it for reproduction but like mm -hmm. th that's it you know just make sure you you have those babies and then you're not supposed to enjoy that so this just shows you that one that like greek and roman societies were they had their own flows they had slavery obviously mm. and, and all that you could go on about it but in many ways, we could learn from them. Like, there's a mm. lot we can learn from them. The same way they could learn from us too. I'm not saying they were oh, perfect, yeah. and we are definitely not perfect either. I did want to just mention a comment from Mouse Utopia Dystopia, who claims apparently, okay, so there are no farmers in pre-agrarian cultures. That might have been my misspeaking. Sorry. I don't know if I said something about that, but he says, he or she, I'm assuming it's a he, I don't know why, that women were more hypergamous in pre-civilized cultures based on genetic data. Well, I would love to see that research. And less hypergamous. There's many different hypotheses about these things. I mean, no actually, one knows for sure, but... <coughs> but that could be the case because um, when we moved into um pair bonding but what does but what does he mean by pre-civilized cultures anyway we were talking about I'm, I'm, together yeah but i'm assuming he means you know what we were talking about about um civil or cultures that were prehistoric and more sexually free yeah there, were, um, there was no hypergamy as we know it today well, I don't know if the genetic data, I'd be interested to see some of this genetic data, but it could be that, you well, know, it, it is what, well, what he might be referring bonding, to, then, you, you know, women have to choose. What he might be referring to is the research showing that at least 60% of women have re reproduced through a, well, yeah, an average 30 of, over, of men. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, so it could be something like that, but that could that could mean many things. That could mean men died in war. Early, yeah, but if, if any if any man is a, an able within a culture, you know, openly to sleep with all of the women, and all of the women can choose any man, then perhaps they all would just choose like a small spectrum of the most successful. Whereas, yeah, but when if, you're talking you know, about hypergamy, openly you have to be pair bonded, then you know the spectrum of the most successful is quickly um, taken off the marketplace, mm. which leaves kind of less successful men in with a chance. But that's why I was saying earlier that hypergamy suggests the way we use it today is that there's a single hierarchy on which men compete, mm. and that wasn't the case. And in those early societies i mean there were shamans who were like rock stars of their day <laughs> we have every reason to assume they weren't fierce warriors or hunters they still had access to women so i just yeah it's just not as black and white some form of some form of women choosing probably existed Oh, of course. But, but of to call course. it hypergamy, because hypergamy specifically refers to more contemporary societies. I just don't think that word makes sense within that context. But women have always been the ones, unless raped, to have made, made that choice, obviously, who to pair bond with. 
my DeLorean, women have lower physical ability and intelligence in war and hunting, construction and such, and better intelligence in social situations. We can agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I can agree with that, you know, in a... I mean, there are always with exceptions. With reservations. As a general rule, yeah. 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 I mean, I don't believe, you know, although in a pinch, if all the men are off hunting, then the women have the capacity to fight, you know, for their mm. territory. But generally speaking, you know, if the men are around, women will leave it to them. And you can see that in the kind of, you know, mass graves mm. from prehistory where there's obviously been some kind of huge conflict. Yeah. You know, most of those bodies are going to be male. There are a few isolated instances, and, and feminists love those examples. Mm -hmm. There are instances where they honoured women, skeletons surrounded by warriors. Horses and chariots yeah. and weapons. Yeah, and war yeah. garments worn in war. But those are isolated instances. Yeah, but they're isolated incidents. But also, you know, we we don't know why they are surrounded by those things mm. like you know perhaps there is a reason that is actually nothing to do with them participating mm. perhaps it was an honorary title for you know some kind of well there, there are of you, you can you can look at their injuries and things like that so there's oh, uh, there are they do have evidence yeah there, there is evidence okay, there's some enough. very isolated cases evidence that women did mm. fight and uh, but you know i mean like viking women were pretty yeah they're mostly viking graves yeah, yeah. but, the, but that's the, but because the point their is... men were away you know had their men been and, there and in sparta too i mean sparta yeah. was a very militarized society yeah. anyway but the point is that the amazonian myth has never been proven the myth of an army an independent self regulating self determining mm. army made of women they that has ever existed has never been proven there's just i just want to comment on mouse utopia dystopias for oh, yeah it does not matter what they believe i assume hunter gatherers because women are more attracted to alpha men when they are most fertile just like bonobos, sexual egalitarianism and during ovulation. That's interesting, actually. It is. There's one of the most famous pieces of I evolutionary like psychology that a, I like that as a little quote, sexual egalitarianism ends during ovulation. That's a neat quote. The thing is, I until, until quite recently, I used to put a lot of faith in that study showing that women are attracted to more dominant men during ovulation. But I recently interviewed David Lay, who's a brilliant sex researcher and sex therapist. And he, unfortunately, because I did kind of try to at least believe in something, he shattered this belief. So he basically says that this research has never been replicated since then. We can only go by personal anecdotes of women being attracted to different types of men during really? different stages I, of their cycle. I heard they I love presenting it as a fact, but it, 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 was, yeah. it was just one or two studies, which and I, I heard that you know um, when women are was it pregnant? I think it was when women are pregnant, they prefer men who have physical features that are more similar to them and who are like more That's genetically similar to them they would probably be true according to that research uh why during menstruation for example or any mm. non-fertile part of the cycle but just one little comment i want to make here because i have a science background and people have to be very careful with with accepting any scientific any piece of scientific research as fact you know you you will read mm. an article on sciencedirect.com or in nature magazine or, or whatever giving you this fascinating data on how all women are attracted to a certain type of man at that specific time in their life whatever what you have to keep in mind is that if you if you search carefully enough, you will find 10 other pieces of research completely contradicting those findings. Mm. So having a single scientific paper with one conclusion doesn't make it a fact. That's why in science we, we speak of theories and that's why we say mm. evolution is a theory. 
because the idea is that we keep it open. A theory is always open to be replaced by a better theory. Mm. And when you when you publish a scientific paper with a with a set of conclusions, it's really just a hypothesis at that point. It's not even necessarily a theory. So you know, people love referring to isolated pieces of research, and sometimes the samples used are so few, maybe just a few hundred people. That's that's nothing. You, you know, mm. if it's if it's something very really striking a journal might pick it up and then it might end up in the ma mainstream news and then yeah. people will completely uh, the journalists will misrepresent it people will completely misunderstand this so you always have to look at the larger picture and you know again once scientific research ends up in the news it always has to be something very shocking and very surprising otherwise no one would be interested in reading that that headline so i just want to warn people about taking every single piece of scientific research that seriously, basically. Shall we have a look at some of the questions yeah. that were sent in earlier before we wrap up? I'll see if... Oh, I don't realise we've been going that long. I know, we're almost at an hour. Okay, let's look at Vernon's questions. This is from Vernon Meigs. When there is more pressure to rightly advocate for female agency, I would suspect that too many women would instead want to fall back in favor of victimhood, male-provided entitlement, damseling, etc. How can we effectively persuade women that female agency, with all the self-responsibility it entails, is the right path to take? Yes, indeed, which is, you know, kind of a question that was occurring to me as we were talking to be honest and you know how do we how do we do it I think that you know there was um a Karen Strawn speech that she gave at the International Conference on Men's Issues I'm gonna say 2018 but I could be wrong but it was called Women Must Consign Feminism to the Dustbin of History mm. and one of the the um, attendees asked her how we were going to persuade women to do that and her response was something along the lines of women are herd animals and we need to make anti-feminism cool you know and so and I tend to suspect because you know it's we've won the moral argument on this you know the likes of like Camille Pallia I mean she's just so much morally purer than all of the other feminists and you know she's much more rational she's won the rational argument mm. um back in the um walk in McKinnon ordinance days you know the sex positive kind of movement won the legal kind of um argument and so it's like what are we missing and i think possibly karen might be right i think it is a matter of women and you know men and especially women and men who are kind of cool anyway standing up and rejecting these kind of regressive victim this regressive victim religion victimhood religion mm. i also like to think that debate has an important role in this i i have a lot of faith in free speech and the idea that we still somehow have it and have a free press and that we can see other, we can see different points of view represented. So I think a key is for people to have access to as many different opinions as possible so that they can make up their own minds. But at the moment, our side is not really represented in the mainstream as much. So <laughs> not really. <laughs> obviously, getting in, being cool mm. in one way or another could be a good gateway to, yeah. to be noticed by the media, I guess. Yeah. But I, I do think that shifting public opinion is the key here. And for that, you just need media coverage. You can't do it any other way. You can't just operate in your own little underground circles and hope 
people will change their minds. I don't know the way things are going. I think we might have to, you know, like have those like you know like underground like study groups and like underground lectures like, when, when to... misogyny is a hate crime and criticism of feminism is classified as misogyny i know but there must be a way to infiltrate the mainstream otherwise people are just not gonna hear these voices i mean as they stumble upon them by accident there, there must be a, a way yeah. i mean there are new platforms coming out you know like gb news and stuff like that and so there are potentially promising developments but i don't know it's really unclear to me whether we have the momentum to stop the tide mm. i know yeah i try to be optimistic but, but you I know agree. what like maybe maybe that's a good thing maybe we actually need to go to hell so that people will realize where we are and um you know get based what other questions have we got have we got any on here i wonder i think a lot of people are talking to each other i'm not sure if these questions are um for us or each other ah We've got one from Michael Abbott. So Michael Abbott has sent us a load of questions um, before the stream. But since he's put this one, this one in the comments is the latest one. So I yeah. think we should go for this. So let's see what he's saying. It's a complex one. Is the existence of a judgmental, though tolerant, monotheistic parent culture necessary for the flourishing of a wide array of subcultures that's an interesting question yeah there has to be a unifying force there has to be a shared set of values definitely yeah yeah but i i think um my response to that i, th I feel like you know he's kind of saying and it's it ties into something that we were discussing before the stream which is the idea of there necessarily being or there having to necessarily be a um you know something that we can identify as normal in order for people to look at normal and go i need to subvert that in this way or that way or the other in order to fulfill myself um but normal should be a range yeah and you know i don't think that you need the existence of a judgmental though tolerant monotheistic parent culture i don't see why the range of normal mm. can't be within any other kind of culture that's you know non-judgmental or intolerant or polytheistic well, yeah i mean you know within this context talking about monotheistic parent culture just doesn't make sense because i mean we're, we're kind of trying to advocate for celebrating and and embracing the plurality and the diversity of the soul and you can't really have that within a monotheistic framework so i wouldn't call that a monotheistic parent culture but a set of pre-agreed very basic principles i guess are necessary to have mm. to have any civilization yeah whatsoever. and i feel like you know we've put christianity through a bit of a ringer over this conversation but actually you know it is part of the foundations of our civilization and i know that we both really appreciate um the christian idea of forgiveness you know i think mm -hmm. that that's been very it's a very it's been a very positive thing to have as part of the foundation of our civilization and we should focus on it a bit more Although because actually, we change the culture yeah exactly exactly what the hell has happened to christian forgiveness you know and the idea that like there's no someone, way to redeem yourself exactly anymore. redemption yeah you know 
now we find a slightly off color tweet from 10 years ago and regardless of the context or mm -hmm. who that person is today you know their life must be destroyed socially and possibly and it doesn't matter if they exhibit forgiveness if they apologize they are just condemned to yeah to absolutely. Rot in hell, basically. absolutely um but you know, I mean, I really, I really like the idea of a flourishing wide array of subcultures too. And so I, you know, mm. I, and I think that that is something that we are losing. You know, we're becoming much more homogenous, mm. at least in our public presentation to each other. Although I'd say that that's actually. I would say that that's improved slightly over the last few years. And I would say that that's partially as a result of Brexit, because, you know, I remember the lead up to Brexit. It was like you would only admit that you were going to vote for Brexit to your absolute <laughs> very closest friends and allies. Mm -hmm. And then we won. And then, you know, now it's at the point where, you know, you can get to know someone only a little bit and then kind of go how did you vote in the referendum you know and it's often the right way um and so i think that you know through partially through literally that incident it's kind of that's liberated people to go oh my god maybe there are people who think like me and you know it's liberated our kind of subjects of conversation and we can find each other you know instead of being stuck in the prisons of our heads we can build those bridges with words to each other again in a way that you know certainly the kind of social justice collective are trying to stamp down on you know desperately and have been for quite some time What was it that Mike Bell was asking? We can actually finish on that. Yeah. So why do modern women spend so much time and money sexualizing themselves and then deny they are doing it and ridicule men who are attracted? <laughs> wow. Well, it's a bit of a schizophrenic state of mind, I guess. Yeah. Because we have, we all have a, an inner, it, it varies amongst different people, but we mm. all have an inner uh, sense of aesthetics. Like mm -hmm. we all appreciate beauty yeah. in one form or another. Yeah. And for many women, you know, we just like looking good. I mean, men mm -hmm. like, well, men don't dress up the same way women do. Mm, some, but yeah. Some do. <laughs> But it, it is more common for women yeah. to want mm. to look good, mm. even when they're just at home by yourself. I know yeah. I know you will still wear a dress and, and yeah. stuff like that when you're... Mm. I, I'm like that too. Other women do it for women, which is the most common, probably. And then many women will do it for men. And that's, that's an inner... There's, I think that's a very deep-seated inner urge that, that we just have that probably really angers a lot of feminists yeah. who just can't reconcile yeah. this yeah. sense of almost like an objective aesthetics, like an objective sense of beauty, which which varies individual from individual, but, but still we all have some standard of what yeah. we find beautiful and not yeah but then at the, on the other hand their ideology tells them that beauty is completely socially constructed and men should be condemned for appreciating it so it is a very schizophrenic psychotic state of mind where you're struggling to reconcile to competing urges within yourself mm. when i spoke to oh. johan nayar with max anthony on um the messages for men podcast he was talking about how within pair bonding relationships because men 
have the instinct for variety with sexual partners women have developed the instinct to change their look drastically so they can be a million different women you know over a million days which i thought was quite interesting but like you say you know there are times when there is not a man within a hundred yards of me and there isn't going to be for the foreseeable future mm -hmm. and i still dress myself up for fun or you know as part of a you know if i'm for example um when i work with particular clients and you know uh, the people i'm thinking of in particular are elderly women I will wear things that I think they will like yeah. and they will appreciate and yeah. it's like a bond. Because... It's a part of social interaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know. But what you're saying I... about men wanting um, variety. Yeah, yeah, I mean chimpanzee males want variety too but chimpanzee females still mm. don't change their looks. So there is something uniquely human about this that, that yeah. we still haven't quite figured out. There's a beautiful Roger Scruton quote where he says that beauty is one of uh, three ultimate values. I think it's truth, beauty, and another one. <laughs> I can find it actually. Um, but he says that we pursue beauty for its own sake mm. and we need not give any more reason for doing so. Um, let me just find out what the third ultimate value is because, you know, I, I might need it. Hello. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I need to restart my bloody computer. Are you kidding me? What a time. Um, but Nietzsche wrote a lot about the inherent value of, of beauty truth too. and goodness mm -hmm. truth goodness and beauty um but yeah and nietzsche mm -hmm. yeah the the inherent value in in beauty and it just so happens that both men and women are drawn to beautiful women it, it is it is not so obvious why yeah. that is why why you have beautiful women both on the cover of men's magazines and women's magazines and yeah it is there are many different many interesting theories about it but you know i don't think it, any one of them is completely right it, it no. is su such a very uniquely human phenomenon no but then you know the other part of mike's question is why they kind of you know women will then demonize and ridicule men who find them attractive it's because there's this these different forces fighting a war in, in their own head so mm. on one level they want to present themselves in a pleasing way on another level they've been brainwashed rationally corrupted to believe there's they're only doing that because the patriarchy has conditioned them to do it so, that, so they kind of hate themselves for having that very natural inner urge yeah and i think you know it's also to do with hypergamy and mm. so you know it's the 50 shades of gray thing where like you know i believe the protagonist is called christian gray you know and i believe he's rich and attractive and it's like he's allowed to be abusive i haven't read it and i'm not going to but you know my understanding is that he's abusive and you know that is acceptable because he's handsome and rich whereas you know had he been some less, mm. yeah, yeah. you know, of lesser status, that would have just been criminal. And I think that, you know, so there are women who will dress up in order to attract men. Certain men. But yeah, exactly, certain men. And if any man, you know, they deem to fall out of that very small little bracket of acceptable mm -hmm. notices them, they're absolutely furious. But there's definitely some brainwashing too, because there are women who, you know, regardless of the status or 
you know, attractiveness of a man will just get really uppity if they get a compliment. Mm. Yeah. But also we shouldn't forget that women judge each other even more harshly too. And they would also call women out if they perceive those women as being, what, are, what do we get called? Like internalized misogynist, or <laughs> pawns of the patriarchy, Handmaidens. whatever. Yeah. So there is a lot of intersexual competition going on oh, amongst yeah. women. And it is true that men don't really care what a woman wears or, or if a woman wears a dress twice or three times, but another woman will notice yeah. that. Yeah, that's and very true. And they will true, call actually. her out for that. So it is one thing that they will ridicule men, but they will just as recklessly ridicule other women too. And, you know, I think that perhaps the antidote might be a resurgence in people in general having gratitude. I think gratitude is a very much kind of um, position or a perspective, an approach to life that we've mislaid mm -hmm. and that we've mislaid to our detriment, you know, and when someone, man or woman of any status notices that I look nice or I'm, you know, um, knowledgeable on a subject or um, have, you know, hoovered well or something, you know, I'm very grateful. And when things happen in my life that are not great, I kind of try to look at the picture and go, but overall, you know, things are all right. And I've, you know, I've got this, which is a good thing and that, which is a good thing. And so actually, and you know, there are bad things that have happened in my life that I look at and go, well, I learned a lesson there that was very important for me. And so I can take some gratitude from that. And, you know, like the social justice warriors look around our society and they're like, there's so much inequality and, you know, it's, there's so much that's been built on slavery and um, there is so much, bias and bigotry and there is absolutely zero gratitude mm -hmm. for the fact that we are you know without a doubt the most fortunate human beings who've ever lived that's a very nice positive note to finish on i think so okay yeah. well thank you for listening everybody and thank you for joining me greta aurora thank you very much for having me over and out <laughs>